we look to the Lord. Amen. Father, we ask, Lord, in a very special way now, your presence, your anointing, your quickening, that we may have, Lord, a hearing ear, a receptivity of spirit, and I would ask, Lord, prophetic anointing, that your word, quickened, anointed, will come forth to the accomplishing of your purpose. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your presence, for we acknowledge that you're here. We love your presence, the movings of your spirit, the apprehending of your will. For each of us, Lord, both individually and corporately, we thank you. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Amen. The last meeting, we shared quite a bit about Revelation chapter 12. The woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. And just very simply said, I believe this speaks of a body of overcomers clothed with the sun, that is, having received a direct word from the Lord. I believe this refers to the woman, the church, the body, the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, the bride, you and I, by the grace of God. Clothed with the sun means that we are in a direct relationship with him. It's divine favor, the bridal garment, acceptance in the beloved, the Lord's hand upon our lives. It, the moon being under our feet means that we are receiving direct words from the Lord, not secondary information, not just information about the Lord that we've heard from someone else. That's moon revelation, secondary, reflected. You know, the light from the moon is reflected light that comes from a different source. And so... As we hear from the Lord, we receive direct revelation. We, the Lord becomes active. And I have within me a tremendous sense of the approbation, the favor of God resting on lives, which is something that we cultivate, the favor of God, where the Lord takes an interest in it and becomes active in our lives. The approbation, the favor of God, it's something that that, that can be cultivated when we enter into a direct relationship, when the Lord becomes personally interested in us and we in him in a unique sense. You know, the word says when you pray, go into your closet and shut the door. Your father who hears in secret will reward you openly. And I believe that speaks again of the favor of God, the approbation of God resting on a life. The Lord becoming interested in me in you as though, though we were the only person in the universe. We have his attention, his total attention. It's something that we go after, that we cultivate. In many circles in the church world, there's a lot of pressure on witnessing, and we certainly ought to do that. And that, that's valid, and we are to go forth, and the fields are white unto harvest, and there's a need for labors and all that. But you know, you can't give what you don't have. And when you begin to receive something, when you begin to meet the Lord, there's a little fellow who will sit on your shoulder and tell you that you ought to be out witnessing to somebody. You shouldn't be, that's selfish. I've had, I've had ministers tell me that, that it's selfish to seek the Lord. We should be concerned for others. But again, you can't give what you don't have. So Luke chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, for just a moment. We're going to start here. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. He goeth up into a mountain. And he called on him whom he would, and they came to him. And he ordained twelve. Now, this is interesting. We think of ordination as an ordination to ministry. Ministry is something you do. But he ordained 12. What, what does the next part of it say? That they should what? 
be with him. See, he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach, to have power to heal sickness, and to cast out devils. That's the threefold working of the gospel. Preach the word, heal the sick, cast out devils. That's one-third, one-third, one-third in emphasis. All those three elements should be actively working within a, within a ministry. But he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth. It's one thing to go, it's another to be sent. There's a big difference. We cannot go or should not go without a message. Now, he ordained 12 that they should be with him. The Lord taught me something a good many years ago. If I am faithful in being with the Lord, if I am faithful in cultivating a relationship, fellowship, communion with him, he will be faithful in sending me. See, the Lord has a burden for others, he's, and he's going to send those that have something to offer. And it is not selfish to spend time seeking the Lord. No man can come except he's drawn, and the Lord has ways of arranging circumstances where that person will meet someone, the right person at the right time with the right word. And so there is that, that coming to the Lord that we might receive a quickened, an anointing, a word. And that's the burden that I have. I believe my calling, ministry, as a teacher, has to do with the preparation of a people to come into a place where they're hearing, knowing the voice of the Lord, and maturing in, in the development of their, their lives, maturing spiritually. And so the Lord's faithful in doing that. There was a particular house that Jesus loved to go to, the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And I just want to share just a couple, I want to use this in a certain way, share a couple thoughts about it. In a meeting one time, just outside of San Diego, I, I said that Jesus really liked apple pie. And so when he got to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, Martha began to bake an apple pie, and she complained that Mary wouldn't help her peel the apples. And of course, I'll come back to that. Well, later, a lady, I got a letter from a lady, and she said, she said, I looked in every commentary, I read every translation, <laughs> and she said, I couldn't find that anywhere. <laughs> so I wrote back and I said, uh, I said, well, I said, there's two approaches to scripture. One is translation. That's very rigid. The other is interpretation. There's a difference. And I believe that what I'm saying does not violate. Of course, Martha complained that Martha was serving. Doesn't say what she served. And Mary wouldn't help her. So, and she complained. You know, there's something, uh, well, I'll just in a minute. So basically, Basically, you know, I'm pretty sure it probably was an apple pie, but really it does not violate the scripture. And so there's a lot of freedom in, in interpretation. In translation, there's, it's very rigid. And the scripture says we know in part and we're facing the last days. And I want to say this. We're approaching the closing out of the church age and the establishing of the kingdom. And I'll say a little more about that in a few moments. And we don't fully understand. I know for a long time, I was hearing ministries say about the Roman Empire being, you've heard that, Europe revived Roman Empire and of a power raising. I, I, I don't believe that is going to happen. I don't believe that's it at all. That it's not this revived Roman Empire that's going to come against Israel. Rather, it's Islam. I believe that's evident that and, and most scholars miss that, or most, most Bible teachers miss that, and they're all, they're all looking for a revived Europe. And I don't believe that's it at all. But I believe it has to do with Islam, uh, marching against Israel and the Lord in intervention, destroying, bringing down Islam. And I, I believe that we're approaching the end times when the Lord is gathering a people together for his purposes to bring judgment on this world. And, 
we have parts of it and we don't have the full picture. And I remember John Follett, he was my spiritual father. He was 85 when he passed on to his eternal reward. And this was back in the mid 1960s. And one time he told me, and I'm sure I shared this, but it, it'll help me say what I want to say. I stopped by to see him. He lived in New Paltz, New York, along the Hudson River and had a beautiful home with a view that overlooked the Catskill Mountains. And he told me that he had had two phone calls that day asking him to come to California. They said, Brother John, get a taxi cab, a first class ticket, we'll pay everything, please. And then he said something like this, said, when I was young, no one wanted to hear what I had to say. Now that I'm too old and I can't go, they want to hear it. Now what he was saying was something like this. He had, he was a forerunner, he was a seer. A prophet is one that speaks prophetically, but a seer is one that sees ahead in advance. It, it goes beyond that, and there are few that are, are highly moved upon by the Lord as a seer. It, it's a very high calling. John Follett was a seer. He saw way ahead of his day. And the message he had was not understood when he was younger and full of energy and life. There was a remnant. He had small meetings where, where, they, where they would rent a motel, a small motel. People would come from all over the country, and there'd be a teaching of those that, that had an ear, that had, had something cultivated within their life, an ability to hear, to respond to that level of ministry. And people would come from far and wide to hear. But the general church, or in, 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 in the average church, they, they spoke disparagingly of him because he wasn't understood because he was way ahead of his day. And a lady once that was very knowledgeable in things spiritual said to me once, she said, do you know what's wrong with John Follett? And I, asked, I said, no, tell me. And she said he was born 50 years too soon. In other words, his message was 50 years ahead. What he said back there that was greatly misunderstood back there would be understood today. And so, there are those that the Lord is calling a ministry of that which is before us, ahead. And we don't have the picture completely right. And so for all of us, the answer is you eat the meat and you spit the bones. <laughs> because we don't have the complete picture and it keeps adjusting. And I believe it is going to come clearer with, with greater clarity as time goes on. There's something, you see, so in, 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 in a sense, I'm, I'm, what, what I'm sharing is in the sense not of translation, but interpretation. And so there's some, there's some freedom. And so I can believe the Lord that, that there's truth within it. And I wait on the Lord and I pray and I seek the Lord that there will be that clarity, a, a clear word concerning the end time, and that there are those that have an ear that are being conditioned, trained. I've had this and I've shared this and I want to be careful how I say this because I, I'm not, I don't want to say it referring, putting myself in any way on, 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 on a pedestal, God forget, for, forbid. But I thank the Lord that I do wait on the Lord and pray and look to the Lord for the word that I share. And I have within me a passion, a desire for a present word for a word that pertains to where we're at now, a word that's going to build to give direction and purpose to where we are today. Not a history lesson or a, pro or a lesson in prophecy, but a present word that will take us beyond where we are. That's my, my, that, that's my prayer life and desire concerning ministry, a present word. But I've had this happen all over the country, from one end to the other. People will come after a meeting, and they'll say something like this. They'll say, the Lord is showing me things. And I have gone from church to church to church trying to find confirmation, and I can't. And I'm beginning to wonder if there's something wrong with me. And I came to your meeting, and I'm hearing exactly what the Lord is saying to me. They get all excited. I've had that happen all over the country. So that's a confirmation to me that... I'm hearing, and I thank the Lord for that. And I believe that through a very specific dealing of the Lord that I'm here in Washington, D.C., and these meetings are ordained of the Lord. 
for the preparation of a people here. I believe, I believe there, are, there are two critical cities in the world, Washington, D.C. and Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the kingdom of God, Washington, D.C. If, if, if the present world order has their way, it'll become the capital of, 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 of a one world government. And that's, that's, their, that's their intention. But the Lord has something else in mind. And so I believe there's a special anointing and enabling on a people in this city. The Lord preparing a people, a body of intercessors, a woman, a corporate woman that clothed with the sun, with direct revelation, that can withstand the powers of darkness and begin to shed a ray of light of the true gospel, of the purpose of God, of the intent of the Lord that will push through and begin to break up and disintegrate the intention and purpose of the enemy and the powers of darkness. I believe that the ministry of intercession, this woman clothed with the sun, a ministry of intercession, that is the most important ministry calling in the world today. Just one more thing on intercession. I could say right now, let's stop and pray. In the higher sense of the word, I cannot say, let's stop and intercede. Because intercession is imparted. It's like you become pregnant from another, the Holy Spirit, with a burden. And then you release that in prayer. Is that you make yourself available to the Lord for his purpose. And he impregnates you with his burden, his desire, his intention. And then you pray it through. In the lesser sense of intercession, it's that... It, 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 it is a prayer that is more than just words. It, it involves the intensity of us b believing intensely with feelings for the birthing and the outworking of that prayer. That's the lower level of intercession. Then as, it come, as that burden is imparted within by the Holy Spirit, it's activated by the Holy Spirit, and there comes an identification with the need, so much so that it becomes physically painful. Some of you know that physically painful and very very extract exacting and difficult but you give birth to it you stick with it till you give birth that's the higher level of intercession and I believe that's the primary burden and calling of the Lord in our day now Mary Martha and Lazarus you know there's a pile of stones I'm told in Israel that says it is believed that this was the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is a lot closer than that. It's right here. And it's two sisters. It's a drama that unfolds. It's a place where Jesus loved to go. There's an interesting verse, two verses. It's in John 14. I won't, we don't need to turn to it, or is it 414? In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, further down, the word says this. If you love me and keep my commandments, I will come and my Father, and we will make our abode with you. We will, we, will make, we will come and make our abode. Where? With you, our abode. All right, the word abode, in, the, in it's verse 23, I believe, and the mansions is the same word, the exact same word. So it's not talking about, I'm going to have a little bigger mansion than you up in glory land. It's not talking about, you know, our, our eternal residence. My father's house are many. What that really is saying, there are many levels of relationship, of understanding, of the moving, the empowerings of the spirit in which we become involved with the purpose of the Lord. And we enter into that. And we become that where the Lord begins to move in and possess and possess this vessel then move out through us to reach others. <clears throat> and so the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus is right here. And when we come and when each of them are in their proper order, it will attract Jesus. He loves to come to a home that's in divine order. So we have two sisters, Mary and Martha. You know, some say I'm a Martha, and some say, you know, you say to somebody, she's a Martha, and she's a Mary. You mean, you know, service and devotion. 
but you can't say that because they're sisters and they're related Martha served Mary sat and it's interesting that it was Martha that was service that complained about devotion see service will always complain about devotion service will always try to get you busy to get you doing something anything but pray because prayer he ordained 12 that they should what be with him and so service will always come against devotion you've got if you if you maintain a devotional life literally you've got to fight for it you have to contend for it because there's something we'll try to push in on it so they're related they had a bro right, two sisters ministry that's a gift Paul said I I ministered according to what the gift so ministry it's feminine our devotional life were a bride it's feminine two sisters service and devotion but they had a brother Lazarus the Adamic nature and what was wrong with Lazarus he was what he was sick he was sick well you, you don't have to read the newspapers too long to realize that the Adamic nature is very sick and service and devotion was determined to get him healed <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord had something else in mind he's not going to heal the Adamic nature it has to do what it's got to die now we're going to look at a verse John chapter that's just a little bit there's a little bit of a ring all right John chapter 11 this is this is very interesting John chapter 11 Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place. Service and devotion are trying to get Jesus to come and pray. And he stayed away on purpose for two days because he loved them. He stayed away. No minister today would dare do that be in real trouble <laughs> but he stayed away on purpose for two days now a day is as a thousand years a thousand years is a day so this is speaking of the church age of the Adamic nature of the struggles the battles Lazarus died he was all wrapped up bound and put in a tomb by the time Jesus showed up he, he, he was thinking well <laughs> the last days the corruption in the world today all that's going on the Adamic nature is very much thinking but there's a word and Jesus is about to speak he's about to say it's in verse 43 of John chapter 11 Lazarus what come forth and Jesus said loose him and let him go I want to say something about this and I'm saying this in the context of all I said because I'm ahead of where we're at but we're approaching this day how many of us have seen people in wheelchairs with, with you know infirm with and we really wish there was something in prayer we had an authority of power have you ever felt that but see but the, the Adamic nature has a hold we're redeemed we're purchased we're putting off judicially the Adamic nature is dead experientially we're putting off the man of sin the Adamic nature we're faced with it in our daily lives we struggle we're crucifying the affections the lust choosing the things of the spirit but we're in, in a great measure we're bound we're not able to function there isn't any real authority but at the end of the second day where are we now we're at the end of the 2,000 years we're there Jesus stayed away he hasn't brought a lot of what we wanted in the level of visitation and empowering and gifting he hasn't done that but he's about to do something in the earth in this day he showed up at the end of the second day 
which is this present time it's exactly where we're at and things are really bad they stink <laughs> in fact but you know the Lord said I am the resurrection of the life see that's what I said earlier about this nation acknowledging our need for the intervention I believe the answer the only valid answer for the problems in the world today is intervention of the Lord the Lord showing up we're at that period of time when he's beginning to move when we can become a part of that we can move with him in identity with his higher purpose Lazarus come forth he's about to speak that word and then the word is loose him and let him go loose him now how do we loose him how, how do we lose answer intercession see there's a release of the purpose of the Lord in the earth the visitation of the Lord the woman clothed with the Son is going to birth out a man child who is to, going to be caught up to the throne to rule all nations this is an end time word this is nothing to do with Mary giving birth to a baby it's a man child fully mature having been dealt with by the Lord ready to be caught up to be given see unloosened at the at the end time like Lazarus loose him we've been in the great in, in the tomb as it were for 2,000 years the Lord is working it's what's within and there hasn't been the outer manifestation in the power of God that we would like to see and the Lord is about to speak a word Lazarus come forth and there's going to be that release a man child a ministry an enabling that ministry is going to be in the body not up here not in the pulpit not a new breed of not no more Benny Hinn's or Roberts Catherine Kuhlman's but it's going to be just you and I very everyday common people are going to begin to be empowered loosened by the Lord moved upon and this visitation is, is, is not going to fill, it may fill stadiums, but that's not where it's at at all. It's the Lord's dealings within lives that are going to touch other lives for the purpose of God. Loose him and let him go. We're about to see miracles. Now, all that Jesus did in his first coming, I'll say, you've heard, I've said this, I was five foot eight. I don't know how tall he was. But the, the single Jesus, that which he did in the earth, the miracles, the miracles that he did led to persecution, severe persecution, which led to crucifixion and resulted in the birthing of the church. But we are the body. He's the head. And in his parousia, in his coming, he's t beginning to take his place as the head of a body of, of, of overcomers with the burden that he has for mankind and that, that's going to be imparted into the body which, which is going to be energized to release it's, it's going to come forth from the grave from where we've been in just time of preparation bound but there's a release of, 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 of an end time ministry that's going to birth a man child that's caught up to the throne that is an authority and, and the Lord's going to begin to do miracles through the corporate body beyond anything this world has ever seen and it will result in persecution absolutely will result in persecution which will culminate in tribulation and lead to the birthing of the kingdom and so it's that point of transition where the Lord is bringing us into something higher and something better And we are indeed living in that time of transition. I believe the Lord is about at the end of the second day. Lazarus is about to be released. The burden. I get burdened. I feel it. I see these people in wheelchairs. And I wished I could just walk up to them. Thinking of a particular lady in California in a wheelchair. I was qu powerfully quickened ab about her being healed. And we prayed many times for her. She's yet to be healed. But I believe she's going to be. But there's coming when there won't be she's going to be 
it, there's going to be that. See, when that loosing comes, that loosing, there's going to come a, a powerful visitation. Now, the Lord will share gifts and ministries. He will not share his glory. This is going to be a manifestation of glory. And it cannot be, the price of exploitation is going to be very high. As in the days of, An, uh, of Sapphira, what was this? Ananias and Sapphira. There was a consequence. And I believe that's going to return because to whom much is given is much required. And so there's coming that empowering. And it has to be done as unto the Lord. Very carefully, without exploitation. And the Lord's going to do that. Lazarus, I believe, is about to come forth. Now, I want to back up just a little bit to what I was saying about being, being ahead, a message that's ahead of our day. The church, the goal of the church is Jesus within, the abiding of the Lord within our lives. The goal of the kingdom is Jesus upon, the government is on his shoulder. See, it's the kingdom, it's Jesus upon. The church, it's Jesus within. The, <clears throat> the message of the church is to whomsoever wills. The message of the kingdom is to he who overcomes. The goal of the church is heaven. The goal of the kingdom is the throne. See, it's a different message. And we're in that time of transition. And because we don't have the complete picture, it's easy to judge, to become critical or indifferent, but there are those that will push through, that'll hear, that'll respond, and that'll begin to enter in. And I believe that the Lord is preparing a people today, as never before, to hear the woman clothed with the sun that is having that direct revelation. Now, in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, Isaiah chapter 50, there's a picture here of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus said, again and again said, of myself I do nothing, but as my Father speaks, I speak, as my Father works, I work. In other words, he had a very direct, open relationship with his Father. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, this is the testimony of Jesus in the Old Testament, given prophetically. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. They marveled concerning ministry that he spoke, not as the Pharisees or scribes, but as one having authority. The Lord God hath given me, that this is a gifting, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak, that's having the right word, these I'm hearing, a word in season. I want to say something about this, a word in season. That means I've got the right word at the right time. Many of us that are used prophetically often receive a word, and as soon as we get it, zippity-doo, we give it. <laughs> And there may be something in that particular setting that provoked that word, but it's not the season to give it. It's a word in what? In season. You have given me a word. See, there's a right time for that word, and we wait on the Lord. I, I know some that have had that sense, and they hold a word, and they wait. They hold it before the Lord. Now, just one more thought. If, you, if the Lord gives you a word, and you know it's not quite time to share it, and you tell somebody, you share with one of your friends what that word is, you have blown the anointing, the empowering of that word. You've, you've released it. And when the word comes, it'll have no effect. When you have a word like that, you hold it, you don't tell anyone. It's absolutely nothing, because if you speak it out, you're going to release the anointing and the effectiveness of that word. And, and then you tell the enemy hears it, and he's going to, he, he'll make an arrangement to nullify it the effect of the word. It's a word in season. Sometimes a word, you may hold it for, for hours, days, weeks, 
But you'll know when that word's to come forth. You wait on it very quietly and hold it before the Lord. You do not share it or tell anyone. A word in season to whom is weary. But you've got the right word at the right time, and you share that word with the right person. Now, how do I receive that? To him that's weary, the one that's needy, the right person. Now, he wakeneth, not getting up to pray in the middle of the night. That's all good, and that happens. I trust it happens. He wakeneth what? Morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. Now, this ear that he's talking about is not this ear, not what you're hearing. It's not that. It's the inner ear of the spirit that brings us into a relationship. Now, he wakeneth, what? Morning by morning. So this morning, I'm, I'm going to enter into the presence of the Lord. I'm going to become quiet. I'm going to still my soul, all the thoughts, activities, until I can get to that place of quietness when I can begin to hear. And I may get two words. But tomorrow morning, if this is what? Morning by morning. So I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow morning. And tomorrow morning I'm going to do the same thing and I'll get three words. But I'm going to do the next thing, same thing the next morning. And I'm going to get a sentence. I'm going to get more. See, it's, this is an ongoing, as I mentioned earlier, that we cultivate the presence of God, a relationship, a closeness. It's what? Morning by morning. I spend time. I wait. I ask the Lord to teach me his voice. I ask the Lord to show me how to separate between the voice of my spirit and the Holy Spirit because it takes something sharper than a two-edged sword sometimes to discern. And so there's that separation between my voice, that which comes from my spirit and the Holy Spirit. And I come into that place of hearing, of receptivity, but he wakeneth what? morning by morning so this is I cultivate and on I have a closet a place where I get alone that's separated that to me is sacred where I wait on the Lord and I spend time day by day morning by morning whenever it may be it's a continual ongoing thing and I'm cultivating the presence of God and I'm hearing I've been sharing this in, in a lot of the meetings. Revelation 3.20 is a pivotal verse that relates to where we're at, the point of transition. I stand, behold, I stand at the door and knock. What's the next couple words? If anyone what? Hears. If anyone hears. The Lord is knocking. The Lord is seeking. He's looking. He's searching out. That's an absolute. If, that's a condition. If anyone. That anyone is you and I. Therefore, if I'm going to hear, it means morning by morning, day by day, I am spending time asking the Lord to sharpen my ability to hear, to cultivate, to teach me how to hear, and, and to separate that which is from my spirit from that which is the Holy Spirit. The Lord will do that. He'll teach us. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, that's our obedience, our responsiveness. I will come in, sup with him. I'll begin to show you. And then I heard a voice which said, come up, come up hither, and I will show you things which must be what? Hereafter. That's that sense of becoming a seer, of, of, of a visionary. I will show you things which must be hereafter. And then we can enter in, then we can pray, we can intercede intelligently, because we'll have a part then in the birthing of those things. And for these things to fall out and work out properly, the Lord must have a body of intercessors, always in a place of transition. A primary ministry calling is intercession. Those that are contending, hearing, responding in that place. And that's the burden that I have above all else. And meeting by meeting, this is what you're going to hear. To cultivate hearing, respond, make ourselves available, come up and I will show you things which must be hereafter. If anyone hears, Lord, I'm available, I'm willing, I desire to be that person. 
Begin to teach me. Begin to speak into my life. Cause me to understand your voice. Lord, I'm willing to become that intercessor. Just like Mary of old when the angel came and spoke into her life. And she said, I don't understand. It's impossible. But I'm willing. I'm available. That's all the Lord needs. I don't understand. It's impossible. But, Lord, I'm available and I'm willing. Now, Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. We can go just a little further. I've shared this and I want to go over it again. We'll get started now and then, Lord willing, next month. We'll, we'll get more involved in it. After six days, See, Jesus stayed away from Lazarus for two days. The two days are the church age. In the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there are four days, basically, 4,000 years. This is the Lord created all that was created in six days. The seventh day, he rested. Four days. This is not calendar time. This is prophetic time. It's different than calendar time. It has to do with the accomplishing of a purpose. And so you can't use calendar time to determine the, exactly the, but, but, but there's a relationship. And we are at the end of the sixth day or the second day of the church. The third day, the millennial day, the seventh day. And so after six days, it doesn't say when, but this is saying this happened at the end of the church age. At the end of the sixth day, the birthing of the millennial day. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. There were 12, but he took three. They had a, a, there was a unique quality or characteristic about these three. And he was transfigured before them. Now, he's showing them something concerning the age to come. But I believe within them there was a unique ability that had been developed. And we're going to back up. And I'm just going to go through this real quick. And I'm going to make a note so I remember. And I want to start here next time and just take my time with this. And I've shared this before, but I want to do it more carefully. In verse 15 of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to them, Whom do you say that I am? Jesus asked, and they said, Well, some say this, some say that. He says, But whom do you say? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it. Simon, you're identifying me not by observation, but by revelation. Simon Barjona, I say unto you that you are Peter. The word Peter means a small stone. Jesus is the rock. Now, Jesus said, I hear from the Father. Now, you're like me. You're a small stone. You're hearing not on the same level, you're a small stone, you're Peter, because it's a small stone, but you're hearing. And on this, and upon this rock, the fact that you're hearing, I'll build my church. Not on the Pope, <laughs> not on Peter being the Pope or any kind of lineage or that, but Jesus is saying that he's going to build the church on the ability to what? To hear. To hear, he's going to build the church. And I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. What is the key? It's a word in season to he, him who is weary. You've got the, right, the key to the kingdom is this. You've got the right word at the right time to the right person. See, you've heard. <clears throat> and with that hearing, when you've heard, there's an authority that's imparted, that's released in that word. There's an authority. And when you speak that word, there's a consequence. There's an effect. And the kingdom is released and comes and it brings things into an alignment with the eternal purpose of God because you're hearing. Therefore, it's tremendously important that we cultivate that ability to hear. And next month, December, I'm going to share some just about cultivating, about that to go through this and then the ability to hear, to cultivate. I'm going to really ask the Lord for something fresh.
The Lord is preparing a body of overcomers. Lazarus is about to be loosened and released. Jesus said, Lazarus, a direct word of intervention. Jesus showed up at the end of the second day. He stayed away for two days. He's done that during the church age, pretty much. But he's about to come on the scene beyond anything that this world has ever seen. He's going to do it, he's going to be, which we shared last time, he's going to be glorified in the saints in 1 Thessalonians. He's going to be glorified in the saints. And the world is about to see a demonstration of the power of God, a visitation of God. They're going to have to make a choice, a decision. The president's been saying, which side are you on? You know, he's saying that very effectively. You're either for us or you're against us. It's been very effective. But the Lord's saying that too. First that which is natural and then. See, there's a parallel there. And the Lord is preparing a people today that are hearing, that are available. As Mary of old, always. There have been times of, of intervention throughout the church age. I've mentioned this many times, uniquely at critical points, Noah and the flood. It was a direct intervention. Abraham, a direct intervention. He was called out, separated. Moses, uniquely prepared, called out to bring deliverance to the Lord's people. David, called out from the sheepfolds, became the king, the first king of Israel. In, in that time of transition, uniquely dealt with by the Lord, so much so that we have the Psalms and the record of David's life and struggles for our admonition and edification. And then John the Baptist, pre preparing the way, a voice in the wilderness, which is needed in our day. And then Mary, I don't understand, not capable, but I'm willing. It's impossible, but I'm willing. I think we all can relate to that. These were, each one of these were a single voice, but in the last days, his voice is as the sound of many waters. It's a corporate moving, a corporate body. And the lamb that appears, I believe, in the book of Revelation is a corporate lamb. It's the body in function, moving. Not Jesus by himself, but he's moving, he's taking his headship and releasing a corporate body that's going to be caught up to the throne going to be empowered and judgments will begin parallel with, with with man bringing judgment upon man the Lord will bring judgment upon mankind and out of it there'll be a mighty redemption that'll take place and by the grace of God we can be a part of it either a victim of it or we can be a part of the answer we can be caught up to that place of involvement with the Lord and all we need do is say Lord I don't understand, but I'm willing. And then, because I am willing, I will start morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear. Lord, I'm dull. I really have, most of us can identify with this. I'm not satisfied with the level that I'm hearing. I don't think any of us are. No matter how much we're hearing, we need to hear more, and we need to hear better. We need to hear more purely the word of the Lord. How do I get it? Morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear. There's no substitute. There's no shortcut. It means I'm setting apart time. One of the most expensive commodities that we have today is spelled T-I-M-E. We've never, mankind has never been busier than they are today. But by the grace of God, I'm going to place my values Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be what? They'll be added. They'll take care of themselves if I'll put him first. I've seen that. You have too. When we put the Lord first, by the grace of God, we're going to do it. Amen. Okay. Let's all stand together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for that which you're speaking to our lives, the challenge, 
the opportunities that we have. Help us, Lord, even now, to make that determination that no matter where we're at in the cultivation of our devotional lives, even, Lord, as in the beginning, you ordained 12, that they should be with you and that you might send them forth. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in coming apart to be with you, that we might indeed be sent forth, that we might be called forth as Lazarus the bold and equipped to become a part of the end time ministry. And Lord, for each one of us, for that ministry will be in the body and not in the pulpit. Help us to hear, to understand, to become a part, Lord, of that which you're doing. As Mary of old, Lord, we are really incapable. We're not qualified. There's nothing within our makeup or circumstances that will permit it. But Lord, we're available and we're willing in the day of your power to become a part of that which you're doing. Help us to hear more clearly. Place within us, Lord, a determination, a set of spirit that we will indeed spend time in your presence, that we'll seek your face, that we'll wait, Lord, upon you, that we'll cultivate, Lord, that hearing ear and we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Lord, now I hold this body before you for that greater work of your grace. Lord, I ask again concerning a meeting place, a place set apart where we can meet together, that you would bring it into being, where we can meet, Lord, together as oft as you would direct. We look to you, Lord, and confess that within ourselves it's not possible, but within you, Lord, it's very possible. And we believe, Lord, that there is such a place. And we're asking, Lord, that it will surface and become available very soon. Lord, we pray now for each one of us that are here, the burdens, the needs we have, that there will be that greater release of your presence, your anointing, the healing, the virtue of life, your life flowing into the lives of each of us, Lord, in healing, in the outworking of your higher purpose and deliverance. And as we pray, Lord, with those that desire prayer, we ask, Lord, we ask, Lord, for each of us that there might be that further equipping, preparation of our lives that we might be released into that place where you would have us to be in this hour and day, properly equipped and ready with a hearing ear. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Glory. Thank you, and Lord bless you. If you'd like prayer, we're here. Brother Steve will be up. He's here and has a marvelous anointing for healing and a, a real word of wisdom. And he'll be here, and I'll be here. And if you'd like prayer, you can come to either or or both, however. And looking forward to seeing you next month. And Lord bless you and thank you.